my name is uh, Johan Hedberg. I work for uh, Intel's Open Source Technology Center. And uh, I've been doing Bluetooth stuff for about 15 years now. Most of that time has been on uh, Linux. Uh, I'm uh, one of the maintainers of the uh, Linux kernel Bluetooth subsystem and the BlueZ uh, Bluetooth stack. Uh, but for the past, uh, I think, two or three years, uh, I've been mostly focusing on uh, Zephyr and spending time there. And um, in this talk, I'll be talking about uh, Bluetooth Mesh. It's, it's something I've been involved in implementing um, now for the past year or so. Um, I'll go through the main details of the uh, Bluetooth Mesh specification, uh, going a little bit in detail on some of the technical aspects of it. And uh, then I'll be also going um, through what our current implementation status of uh, Bluetooth Mesh is for uh, Zephyr and, and for Linux, and a little bit also on uh, what our plans are for the uh, foreseeable future. So um, Bluetooth Mesh uh, is a new specification that came out from the Bluetooth SIG this year. Uh, it came out in the middle of um, July. And uh, for the first time, it extends uh, Bluetooth um, connections to a true mesh like many-to-many um, -many multi hop uh, topology. Uh, it doesn't have any new demands on Bluetooth hardware. So it, any Bluetooth hardware which is capable of running uh, Bluetooth low energy, that is uh, Bluetooth 4.0, will be able to do uh, Bluetooth mesh. Um, it's uh, worth mentioning, though, that in most cases, it does require some operating system um, updates. So for example, current iOS and um, Android versions, they're not able to do mesh natively uh, yet. I would expect them to get some updates at some point to that. Uh, there's a fundamental uh, aspect of mesh, which is broadcasting messages, uh, relaying them. And uh, it's basically kind of a managed flooding of messages, the way that the messages go through a mesh network. Um, you don't get uh, super high uh, data transfer speeds with Bluetooth Mesh, so it's most uh, suited for uh, simple signaling, small signaling packets. Uh, you can, of course, do large data transfer with it, but the uh, transfer speed won't be that great. Um, message uh, publication and subscription is a fundamental aspect also of Mesh, and it is something I'll go into a little bit more detail. It's a way of kind of organizing who's sending messages and who's receiving messages in a Bluetooth Mesh network. And uh, security is something that's built into the core of Bluetooth Mesh. And you, you'll find that at many different levels and, and uh, uh, layers in the Mesh spe specification. But uh, I'll have some more on, on that also later in the presentation. And uh, one of the biggest benefits, of course, of Mesh is that uh, you get way more range that, than you get with traditional Bluetooth, which in most uh, circumstances is around 10 meters or so. Whereas, whereas with Bluetooth Mesh, when you have the multiple hops, you can get uh, kilometers of uh, range. Uh, for a single message. Um, a little bit about how uh, Mesh fits into what's already there uh, for uh, Bluetooth. Uh, the concept of pairing might be familiar to, to many of you, and that's something that's existed from the very beginning with Bluetooth. It exists for Bluetooth Classic, and it exists for Bluetooth Low Energy. And that's basically, uh, as the name implies, pairing up two devices for one-to-one uh, -one, uh, connection. And that's the kind of... Uh, kind of way that you use most uh, Bluetooth devices today. Uh, Bluetooth uh, Low Energy also brings the possibility of doing broadcasting from uh, one device uh, to many devices. So you could have uh, uh, something typically called uh, beacons, where you have one device broadcasting and many devices who are then able to, to receive that. And Mesh now uh, fills in the missing piece there, basically uh, enabling uh, many-to-many uh, communication. And um, Typical use cases uh, you will see this with will be um, building automation, uh, sensor networks, uh, in your home, uh, common use case that we actually already see devices in the market, even though it's just a few months since the specification was, went public, is uh, smart lightning, uh, where you have uh, light switches and lights talking to each other through a mesh network. Um, then a little bit how mesh fits into the um, uh, traditional roles that you have specified for uh, Bluetooth low energy. On a very high level, you, you can um, categorize uh, Bluetooth low energy roles into uh, connection-oriented and uh, connectionless. 
the uh, connection-oriented roles uh, are the uh, central and the peripheral, where the central is the one initiating a connection to one or uh, more uh, peripheral devices. Um, a PC or a phone would be your uh, typical um, uh, central, whereas uh, sensors, a heart rate monitor, something like that would be the peripheral. But these are always one-to-one -one, uh, connections. Uh, and then you have the connectionless roles in LE, which is the observer and the broadcaster. And as the names imply, uh, the observer is just sitting there passively uh, waiting for uh, packets to come. And a broadcaster is broadcasting packets to anybody who might be interested. And uh, because of uh, this uh, feature of the observer broadcaster uh, pair, it's, it's well suited for mesh, and that's actually what uh, Bluetooth mesh uses. So every uh, node in a Bluetooth mesh network is both an observer and a broadcaster in that sense. Um, a little overview of the kind of nodes that you will find in a Bluetooth mesh network. This is a completely imaginary example, just, just for the purpose of highlighting all the different kinds of uh, nodes that you can have uh, participating in a mesh network. Uh, at the root of uh, a mesh network, you have something called a provisioner. And uh, the provisioner is responsible for managing the address space of the mesh network. Uh, and uh, it, it's the one responsible for taking any new uh, mesh device into use and making it a functional uh, node in the mesh network. Uh, it, it will hand out the uh, uh, assign address uh, or addresses uh, to the uh, nodes, give the initial network key, and, and so on. Uh, if you start going uh, uh, through this from uh, the uh, left there, the uh, gut client and the gut proxy uh, let me first clarify. Uh, GUT stands for uh, Generic Attribute Profile, and it's the protocol that essentially all existing uh, Bluetooth Low Energy devices use to communicate with each other. Uh, these features exist in Bluetooth Mesh to enable uh, compatibility with existing legacy devices that cannot talk uh, the Mesh uh, advertising and scanning-based um, protocol natively. Uh, so that would be the sit current situation with your mobile phone OSs, since, since the, you cannot actually, with their current APIs, do the kind of advertising and scanning that's needed by Mesh. So you would have, for example, um, an older phone acting as the GUT client, and then you would have a device called a GUT proxy that's responsible for bridging this one-to-one uh, -one connection to the actual uh, Mesh network and proxy messages back and forth there. Then you can have one or more uh, devices. Uh, let me see if this one actually works. Nope. Uh, one or more de devices acting as uh, a relay in, in the network responsible for uh, forwarding messages. Um, and then you will often have uh, pairs of devices called friends and low power nodes. I'll, I'll get into this uh, in a bit more de detail later. But the general idea is that you have friend nodes which are caching messages for low power nodes, which then ask the friend node at, at uh, uh, intervals, like if there are any messages uh, destined for the low power node. Um, then a little bit about the various stages that a mesh node goes through. Um, when you buy a new device, it will be unprovisioned, it will be completely unusable in a mesh network until you go ahead and use provisioner to provision it. And uh, during the provisioning, uh, you basically give the initial network key to the node, uh, you assign it uh, an address. Uh, there's one thing missing here, actually, which is the uh, device key, which is a special applica pairwise application key uh, only between the provisioner and that one node, which is then used for configuring and some, some other things. Uh, once you provision it, uh, it's still not fully usable uh, in the mesh network. Uh, you need to assign it additional application keys. Uh, you need to configure the uh, publication and the subscription uh, addresses and so on. And the configuration is done using this uh, device key that was given during the provisioning phase. And uh, once you complete doing the configuration, then uh, the node is uh, kind of a full mesh network node and is able to participate and do anything that you need to do with it. Uh, now, later on, uh, maybe you sell your device, maybe you lose it, uh, something like that. Uh, there's a feature in the Bluetooth mesh called uh, blacklisting, which operates uh, through uh, a functionality called uh, key refresh. So uh, what the provisioner can then do is that it can hand out uh, new keys 
to the nodes in the network. It will do those using the pairwise uh, device key. But it can then selectively um, leave out specific nodes that it doesn't want to give the new keys to. And that way, it essentially um, excludes those devices from the mesh network. And once you do that uh, to a mesh node, it becomes unusable. You cannot participate in the network until you go ahead and reset it. And then it comes back into the unprovisioned uh, state again. So basically, full cycle. Um, now let's look a little bit uh, at the uh, kind of logical uh, composition of uh, nodes uh, in, in a mesh network. Uh, each node that's participating in a mesh network uh, has one or more so-called elements. And uh, an element in a mesh network, that's the smallest addressable entity that you can have. So each element has a network address um, that you can send messages to it uh, with. And uh, each element, in turn, uh, consists of one or more, more so-called models. Now, what the model essentially is, is just a, collect a collection of uh, messages and states relating to those messages. And uh, the messages are identified using opcodes. And uh, that, that's basically it. Uh, on a high level, you could categorize the uh, models to client models and to server models, uh, where client models are those that uh, typically initiate uh, sending messages, um, requests. Uh, and on the receiving side, you have a server model that's receiving it and then responding typically with some kind of uh, response message to the request. Um, about the various protocol layers, so it, it's not a super simple specification, and, and there are several layers in, in, in the mesh specification. Uh, if you start there from the bottom, it might be simpler to go bottom up instead of uh, top down. Uh, there's the uh, transport layer or, or the uh, bearer la layer. And uh, for native mesh operation, all you have is the advertising bearer. That's kind of the na na native uh, mesh uh, transport. Uh, but then if you have these legacy devices, uh, like you would have to do with uh, your existing phone, you have the option of using the uh, gut bearer there instead of the advertising bearer to be able to talk to, to mesh networks with uh, legacy devices. Uh, on top of that, you have the network layer, which uh, takes care of the network uh, layer addressing of devices. So that's how you talk to specific uh, elements in the mesh network. Uh, you have the network layer um, encryption that's taken care of uh, there and the uh, authentication. And uh, there are some other details there, which I'll go into later also, which, which are part of the network layer. Uh, then you have the upper and the lower transport layer. There are some kind of generic functionalities that are taken care of uh, there that are needed for the mesh network. Uh, segmentation and reassembly is something the lower transport layer is responsible uh, for. And uh, in the upper transport layer, there's things like uh, heartbeat and uh, friendship, uh, which uh, I'll get into later. The uh, application layer encryption is also taken care of uh, on the upper transport layer. On top of that, uh, you have the multiplexing of uh, messages in, into the specific models that implement those messages. So the access layer will be looking at the uh, opcode containing the message and then uh, forwarding it to the relevant model in question that's supposed to handle that message. And then at the very top, you have the uh, actual models that uh, define the various states and, and uh, messages and behavior related to those. Uh, the, uh, the mesh specification itself actually comes with uh, a couple of so-called foundation models. Um, which are used for, uh, they, they are mandatory for every single node in a mesh network to implement. They are used, for example, for configuring uh, uh, the mesh node, giving it keys, configuring the uh, various addresses, and uh, so on. And then there's a separate specification called the mesh model specification that was released at the same time, and that one then has a bit more specialized models that not every node uh, will be uh, interested in implementing. Um, if you look at the uh, the main fields in a mesh network PDU, it looks like this. Um, there is um, inherent uh, replay protection in the mesh network where you have an ever-increasing uh, index number combined with something called the uh, IV index. And uh, the first bit there is actually uh, just uh, the least significant bit of, of the uh, IV index that's used for the receiving uh, device to know whether it's the current IV index or the previous one that should be used to decrypt. Um, then you have a 7-bit uh, uh, network ID. Essentially, all this is is uh, kind of hash 
of uh, the network key to uh, allow for early filtering out of uninteresting uh, mesh packets. So uh, uh, when a node is receiving uh, mesh messages, it would first look at those seven bits. And if they don't match any of the known network uh, keys to the node, it can just discard the message immediately. It doesn't have to go through uh, the uh, process of trying to decrypt it and so on, which would be consuming quite a lot of uh, power. Then there's a bit for indicating whether it's, uh, it's uh, like a signaling packet for uh, generic network control, like an acknowledgement of, of segments or uh, something like that. Uh, there's a time to live value that's uh, used to make sure that the message eventually dies out uh, when it gets relayed through the network. Uh, there, there's the sequence number, which gets incremented for every message when a node sends those out, which is important for um, protecting against uh, replay, attack, uh, replay attacks. When receiving the message, uh, the sequence number is combined with the IV index, um, which each um, node is aware of. And the, the first bit there, the IVI bit, is, is a hint of which of two possible IV indexes should be combined with the sequence number then, uh, to uh, decrypt and, and verify against the uh, replay protection. Uh, then you've got the actual addresses, so who is sending the message. Uh, and uh, who is the recipient of the message. And after that, uh, you have the actual um, transport payload, the, uh, the application payload. And uh, at the very end uh, of the message, you have the network layer message integrity check, which can be either four bytes or eight bytes. Uh, usually the way uh, this is done is that uh, if you have an application payload that has its own message in integrity check, then that one will be four bytes. And then in, in, in such a case, the uh, network message integrity check is also four bytes. So, so you always have either four, uh, eight bytes, so either four plus four or then eight. Uh, you would use eight in the case of having a uh, so-called network control packet where you don't have an actual application layer um, encryption. In that case, the, the CTL bit uh, will, will be set to one. A uh, little bit about the kinds of addresses. So as, as you saw, uh, uh, mesh addresses are 16 bits. And they have, uh, can, can be subcategorized uh, in, into a couple of different uh, types. Uh, you have address 0, which is uh, not used for anything else except to say that this is unassigned. This is not used for anything. It's uh, never, uh, actually, that's not true. It, it is sent over the air, but uh, mainly to indicate that this is like an invalid field or something like that in, in a, a message. Uh, then you have an address that's unique for every element in the mesh network. It's called a unicast address. And that's the address handed over um, by the provisioner to the nodes that it's provisioning. And uh, then you have the group and the virtual addresses. I'll, I'll start with the group address. So that's basically uh, uh, an address that uh, a node can either publish to or subscribe to and uh, enables sending a message to multiple devices. Um, a virtual address is a special kind of group address. Uh, it's in reality a 128-bit uh, so-called uh, virtual label UUID that's only known internally by the node. It's never sent over the air. And the virtual uh, address, the 16-bit, is a kind of hash of that one. And uh, there's like extra authentication information passed when, when you're doing the... Uh, the encryption of the message, where you will include the full 128 bits there, so the recipient can then verify that, yes, this was actually this 128 bits that, uh, that matches this virtual address, that is not a collision of another uh, virtual label UUID. Um, relaying, uh, which is fundamental uh, to, to Bluetooth mesh, basically the way it works is that you have the time to live value. Uh, when a node receives a packet, uh, it will First of all, it will decrypt uh, the, the packet with its uh, network key. That way, it gets access to all of these uh, most important uh, network layer um, headers, one of which is the time to live. It will decrypt it. Uh, if the value is still uh, greater than zero, it will go ahead and uh, re-encrypt it with, with the new value and then broadcast it back out to the mesh network. An important thing to notice here is that the application payload stays untouched when you're doing uh, relaying. So uh, a relay device in a, in a mesh network doesn't need to have any kind of knowledge of any application keys uh, whatsoever, uh, which is a nice thing to have if you have uh, some security-sensitive messages that you are sending between two nodes. 
if your relay or many relays get compromised, they will never get access to the actual payload there because they don't have the application key in, in that case. Um, message publication and subscription, I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, it, it's also a core uh, feature of uh, Bluetooth Mesh. Uh, I've used here as an example the, the smart lightning case. So uh, you, on the left there you will have your uh, light switches and on the right you have the actual li uh, lights. And, and the way we've group, grouped them here is based on what room the lights are in. Uh, so the way you would go about configuring the lights is that you uh, configure a subscription address to them, a, um, a group address that's assigned to that specific room where the light is in. And the switches, in turn, are configured to publish uh, to uh, specific group addresses, and that's how you can reach the right room with, from the right uh, switches. And uh, the convenient thing with this is, is that if you at some point uh, you get a new light, uh, you don't need to go and reconfigure your light switches uh, to make them talk to the new light. Instead, all you need to do is you need to configure the new light to subscribe to the appropriate group address that's assigned to the room that you put the light in, and it should work um, after that without touching the switches in any way. Um, then a little bit more detail about the security features uh, that um, Bluetooth Mesh has. So uh, starting with the provisioning, when you take a new device into use um, into a mesh network, uh, this is actually uh, the mesh provisioning protocol is modeled based on um, the uh, Bluetooth pairing uh, protocol. So it uses the same security mechanisms. Uh, this involves uh, elliptic curve uh, Diffie-Hellman, where you uh, receive the remote public key, combine that with your own uh, private key to generate a DH key, and then that one is used to have a secure relationship uh, there. Uh, there are mechanisms for uh, passing information over out of band, so you can get the public key out of band, or you can get some other uh, piece of information like, like a pin code or something like, uh, like that out of band uh, during the actual uh, provisioning. Uh, same thing as you get with uh, Bluetooth uh, pairing as well. Uh, then once you know this provision, and it's part of a mesh network, uh, you have uh, two layers of uh, encryption going on there. You have the network layer, um, and you have the application layer. And as I mentioned, this is useful, for example, for, for the relay use case, where you don't need to give application keys to every single node in the network. And uh, since uh, mesh uses broadcasting of messages that anybody uh, can receive, it's extremely simple if there wasn't some kind of protection mechan mechanisms for it to uh, implement uh, a replay attack on a mesh network because you, you just uh, you don't need to know what what the packet is you just hold on to it for some time and then you send it back out let's say you have a door lock and uh, there's no replay protection so uh, somebody unlocks the door uh, your neighbor hears the packet doesn't do anything with it uh, for hours or for a day and then the next day they go ahead and just uh, send the packet back out and the door uh, unlocks again. So uh, to protect against this, there's a continuously incrementing number uh, called the sequence number, which is combined uh, with the IV index. Uh, in total, uh, these are 56 bits uh, long. So it will take, I think it's millions of years or something like that, uh, with, with your typical sending out the packets before they loop around and, and would actually cause a compromise. So in practice, that, that should never happen. And uh, the IV index doesn't ne uh, does, uh, never goes over the air itself. There's only the one uh, bit of it that, that you saw earlier. Uh, instead, each uh, node has an idea of what the current IV index is, and then there's a whole procedure called the IV index update procedure, using which every node in the mesh network uh, agrees that, okay, now they switch to the next IV index to use that. And every node is always able to receive with the current one and the previous one uh, in case they're a little bit out of sync. Somebody's using the new one, somebody's using the old one, but everything should still uh, keep working all the time. Uh, and then this thing, if, if somebody steals your device to get access to the keys or you sell it or something like that, you can uh, do the key refresh procedure to exclude them from the network. And, and uh, that way, uh, not, not, not uh, be compromised. Um, the uh, advertising uh, packets that Bluetooth Mesh uses, uh, they are small. Uh, with... Um, 
before Bluetooth 5, uh, which is what uh, Mesh relies on, it, it builds on top of uh, Bluetooth 4, you can have 31 uh, bytes of advertising packet data. And that means that the packets that get sent, they are small, and it, it causes interesting challenges if you want to send any uh, bigger uh, chunks of data. So there's uh, the concept of uh, segmentation and uh, reassembly. So if you have a message that's more than 15 bytes, 15 bytes is the, is the biggest amount of uh, payload that you can fit in an unsegmented message, then you can go ahead and split it up into segments. And uh, Bluetooth Mesh allows messages to be split up uh, until uh, 32 segments. Uh, the 32 comes from the fact that there, there's a, a bit field of acknowledged segments that you keep track of. And that then gives you uh, of uh, 384 bytes of maxim maximum segmented message payload size. Um, unsegmented messages, uh, they're unreliable, so you, you never get any kind of acknowledgement on, on these. The way you can work around this is uh, you can have a response message uh, from the, uh, another unsegmented message uh, from the uh, server model. Uh, a simpler way uh, to do this, which doesn't require kind of any changes on the higher layers, is that if you have a payload that can fit into an unsegmented message, you go ahead and encode it anyway into a single segment, uh, single segment segmented message. And that way you force the uh, receiving side to send you a segment acknowledgement that it has received the packet. So uh, this is a, a common trick to do if you want to have uh, a reliable uh, sending of a small message. Uh, then uh, about uh, friendship. Uh, so every mesh node, uh, in principle, needs to be listening for mesh packets all the time in the mesh network. And this can consume quite a lot of power. So uh, luckily, th there's a solution for this in the mesh specification uh, to cover for those devices which have very limited power supply. Uh, the general idea is that uh, you pair up your uh, low power nodes, which would the ones with the limited power supply, with something called friend nodes. Friend nodes are those that would have a persistent power supply. And, and the basic idea is that uh, when you establish the friendship, the low power node says that I'm going to wake up uh, you know, this uh, period, uh, using this period, and uh, the friend then caches up messages for it, and whenever the low power node pulls, the friend node will replay those messages to it. And that way you can achieve uh, really, really uh, small re receive windows for the low power node. It can wake up for just a couple of milliseconds every few days or something like that. So you can really extend the, the battery life. If you think about the, uh, the smart lightning use case I mentioned earlier, uh, this would be a perfect fit for that because your, your lights, they will have a, a stable power source. So they are the perfect friend nodes, whereas your uh, light switches uh, would typically have a, a small battery uh, in them. Also, the light switches, they don't need to re really receive messages that often. They, mostly they're just sending messages when you flick the switch. So uh, it's a perfect combination for the friendship. You would make the uh, lights be the friends and the uh, switches be the uh, low power nodes. So uh, how far are we then with uh, implementing support for this? Um, the uh, Zephyr implementation, uh, it's, it's something we were working on before the specification actually went public, and uh, we uh, sent it for upstream inclusion as soon as the mesh specification uh, was released in, uh, in July. And it's part of the latest uh, Zephyr 1.9 release. Uh, it has all the features that are mandatory in the mesh specification. There are a couple of optional ones that we are still working on. Uh, we've been testing that against tens of other uh, implementations, both uh, before the spec went public as, as well as after it. And uh, actually, uh, another um, project, Minute Project, ported it over uh, to them as well. And uh, uh, they've been doing fixes there and sending back over to, to Zephyr, so we've uh, benefited from, from that quite a lot. We also have demos of the implementation on, on various boards. Uh, we have a demo here at, at the conference. If you come to the Zephyr booth, we have uh, microbit uh, devices there showing the basic functionality of uh, Zephyr Bluetooth Mesh. And uh, in particular, because of the microbit, uh, the BBC microbit devices, they only have 16 kilobytes of RAM. Uh, that has forced us to really optimize the, the memory footprint of, uh, of Zephyr Mesh. So uh, the simplest configuration that you can have with it is about 12 kilobytes of RAM. That it fits the, the entire Bluetooth stack, the OS, and, and uh, the mesh support there. Uh, on the Linux side, we're a little bit behind. 
uh, but we are working on it. Uh, the latest uh, Bluesy release uh, already contains initial pieces of uh, mesh support in terms of a mesh control tool. Uh, this one, however, only implements the, the GUT uh, functionality. So it has a GUT client uh, with which you can configure other uh, nodes, and uh, it can act as a GUT provisioner, do provisioning over GUT. And we're hoping, probably you're going to see the patches still on this year's side, but um, we're working on uh, implementing a proper uh, solution for the native mesh, where the uh, Linux kernel will be responsible basically for the advertising and scanning, and uh, user space uh, will be responsible for the rest. We're going to have a new uh, daemon there called uh, MeshD that then uh, takes care of this. Um, we're working on uh, doing some optimizations uh, that standard, uh, the standard host controller interface of uh, Bluetooth doesn't allow, particularly for uh, friendship. Uh, using standard uh, HCI from Bluetooth 5, you cannot actually get the smallest possible timings that uh, the friendship negotiation would allow for. So uh, we are going to be implementing these extensions in the Zephyr uh, controller uh, to be able to do this, and we're going to have support for them both in the Zephyr uh, Bluetooth host as well as the uh, Bluesy on uh, Linux side. And uh, I'm currently quite busy implementing the French support. That's what one of the missing pieces in, in Zephyr. So hopefully for the next uh, Zephyr release, we're going to have uh, French support. And then we all, all also are starting to look at the uh, model mesh model specification to uh, see if there's anything uh, interesting there that could be implemented as part of Zephyr. Uh, most of them I would expect to be on a kind of per application basis. Um, and we're also trying to come up with various uh, demos to, to show off uh, the mesh. The one thing that we have here is, is the one using the micro bit. So if you're interested, just uh, come to the uh, Zephyr uh, booth. It's there uh, across from the uh, reception. And uh, with that, uh, I'm actually done. Are there any questions? Yes? Uh, okay, so the question was, is it possible to send custom data uh, to nodes? Yes, uh, so uh, we expose a completely generic uh, model, uh, mesh model interface, and you, you can do any kind of custom model that you want with that to send anything, receive anything. Yeah. Yes? Yeah? No, they are kind of leaf, leaf nodes. So no, they cannot. Uh, so the question was about the legacy, uh, legacy devices which talk to GUT. So they can only uh, send or receive, but they cannot relay any, any information in the network. There was some more, yes? Multiple, uh, multiple provisioners. Uh, so uh, there's currently, I, as far as I know, there's, there's no public specification for this, how multiple provisioners would be able to share knowledge of the address space, so what addresses have been assigned, what keys have been assigned. Uh, so at the moment, if you want to do it, uh, you need to have some custom solution for, for it. I know that there's uh, work in progress to come out with, with a standard uh, format for sharing uh, provisioning information, and that way you can have multiple provisioners to do that. So it's, it's technically it's perfectly doable right now, but there's no open standard for that at the moment. Yes? Uh, well, the provisioner uh, is only needed to be around to provision initially the devices. After that, it, it, it can go away, and the devices will keep operating in the uh, mesh network uh, until you need to reconfigure something or hand out new keys. It's only then when you would need the, the provisioner. Uh, did that answer the question? No, no, you would need to add provisioner. So in that sense, it, it might be good to have some redundancy to share the provisioning information with other potential provisioners. Yes? Uh, so there's, uh, I mean, the specification is public. You, you can find it, first of all, well, for, for the mesh model specification. You can find it on Bluetooth.org. It has got things. Uh, Concepts like uh, time synchronization across the mesh network it has a concept of scenes where uh, you can kind of save the current state of uh, like how bright the lights are at the moment and then you can restore it later. Uh, all the smart lighting models are part of the mesh model specification. I think it has maybe 20 different models or so at the moment and they're going to be creating more of them. Yes?
Sorry? Uh, the, uh, no, not really path discovery. There, there's a way to discover how many hops away uh, nodes are from each other. That's done using the, the uh, heartbeat, uh, where uh, the message contains the initial TTL value, and then you compare that with the received TTL, and then you know how far it is. But the actual path it took, there's, there's no kind of uh, mark made on, on the packets as they go through the network. So no, you would have to do that on using some higher level uh, protocol if you want that. Yep. Um, so, so the question is, how, how, do, how, doesn't, how isn't there too much back and forth bouncing of messages or something like that? Well, the, uh, the replay protection list is one way that, that prevents it. Uh, the time to live is another way, so it eventually it dies out. But uh, what happens if you have two, two relays uh, broadcasting or relaying the same packet twice? Uh, when it realizes it, it's, it's still the same packet with the same sequence number. So uh, when another node sees those both uh, relayed packets, they will see the same sequence number in them. And the way that the uh, replay pr protection list works is that if you see the same sequence number that you've seen before, or you see an older sequence number, you discard the message, you don't process it. So that, that's basically uh, what happens when the same message is, is around. Yep. Uh, it will, uh, so th there's um, a, a feature called uh, secure uh, network beacons in, in the mesh specification that most nodes will broadcast periodically. And uh, that beacon actually contains the current uh, index number. So if you've lost sync with the current um, IV index, you listen for those beacons and, and you can have a guess at what the current uh, index number is, uh, IV index number is like that. Yes? Well, it uses packet flooding. You mean somebody uh, is uh, saturating the... Uh, well, uh, the replay protection list is supposed to pr uh, protect against that. I mean, since everything uh, has the message integrity check codes and you've got the replay protection list, you can't just send uh, random data. It will be discarded immediately because it will not match the, any of the keys in the network and so on. And, then, uh, and you cannot replay the same pa uh, packet again either because of the seeker's number and the... Uh, uh, replay protection list. Yeah. 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 Th that's true. So if, if you have a if you have a rogue node that has ownership of the network key, it can do bad things to the network. Uh, it, it's limited. It's, it's not as bad as uh, it having all of the application keys and can do everything. But uh, you basically, you need, you need to do. Uh, uh, you can have multiple network keys, first of all. You can do a little bit distribution of, of uh, what functionalities are available for, for what nodes, so you can limit the, uh, the impact if, if a node gets compromised. And it's important also to do the provisioning procedure in, in a secure manual, manner that you don't get man-in-the-middle attacks there at that point. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, so every uh, mesh packet goes out on all three advertising channels. There's some work in progress to potentially do some improvements on this, but at the moment you're scanning on all three advertising channels and you're sending each packet on all three uh, advertising channels. Is there still? Yes? It's a, it's a standard. I'm not sure what you mean. The, the, there's a standard Bluetooth mesh specification that was released as a Bluetooth standard in July. Yeah, that's, that's what this presentation is about. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> yes? Uh, you don't need controller updates. You, you need the host OS updates to, to get the, the, the host stack updates to get the native mesh support for, uh, for Linux, for iOS, for Android, and these things. The actual Bluetooth controller in, in those that doesn't really need updates. Yeah. 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 
So the question was about legacy devices, uh, what, why it's using GUT. Uh, well, first of all, GUT is the API that's available with, with the existing OSS. So that, that, that's why GUT is the chosen uh, legacy uh, support method. And uh, you don't get uh, uh, fine enough granularity uh, access to, to the scanning and the advertising to be able to do native mesh. You need some updates from the OS uh, for that. All right. Uh, we're starting to be uh, out of time here, but OK, take one more. Yes, there was still. Yeah. You're asking, can Mesh take advantage of two meg phi or? Uh, so that's that's a con connection oriented thing, and since Mesh uses advertising and uh, scanning, it cannot take actually uh, advantage of that. It will be able to take advantage of uh, advertising extensions where you get more payload. But the current Mesh specification, it, it just uses Bluetooth 4.0, so it doesn't doesn't use that. Um, I think I'm going to cut the questions there. If, if you're interested uh, to ask more questions, just come to me. I'll I'll be happy to answer them. But uh, we are uh, out of time right now. But uh, thank you for uh, listening.